Stein, Steinbeck's The Pearl, chapter 4, page 72. Kina did not move nor ask for his supper. She knew he would ask when he wanted it. His eyes were entranced, and he could sense the wary, watchful evil outside the brush house. He could feel the dark, creeping things waiting for him to go out into the night. It was shadowy and dreadful, and yet he called, and yet it called to him and threatened him and challenged him. His right hand went into his shirt and felt his knife. His eyes were wide. He stood up and walked to the doorway. Juana willed to stop him. She raised her hand to stop him, and her mouth opened with terror. For a long moment, Kino looked out into the darkness, and then he stepped outside. Juana heard the little rush, the grunting struggle, the blow. She froze with terror for a moment, and then her lips drew back from her teeth like a cat's lips. She set Coyotito down on the ground. She seized a stone from the fireplace and rushed outside, but it was over by then. Kino lay on the ground, struggling to rise, and there was no more, and there was no one near him. Only the shadows and the strike and rush of waves and the hiss of the distance. But the evil was all about, hidden behind the brush fence, crouched beside the house in the shadow, hovering in the air. Juana dropped her stone and she put her arms around Kino and helped him to his feet and supported him into the house. Blood oozed down from his scalp and there was a th long, deep cut on his cheek from ear to chin, a deep, bleeding slash. And Kino was only half conscious. He shook his head from side to side. His shirt was torn open and his clothes half pulled off. Juana sat him down on his sleeping mat and she wiped the thickening blood from his face with her skirt. She brought him pulque to drink in a little pitcher and still he shook his head to clear out the darkness. Who? Juana asked. I don't know, said Kino said. I didn't see. Now Juana brought her clay pot of water and she washed the cut on his face while well, she while he da stared dazed ahead of him. Kino, my husband, she cried, and his eyes stared past her. Kino, can you hear me? I hear you, he said dully. Kino, this pearl is evil. Let us destroy it before it destroys us. Let us crush it between two stones. Let us throw it back to the sea where it belongs. Kino, it is evil. It is evil. And as she spoke, the light came back in Kino's eyes so that they glowed fiercely and his muscles hardened and his will hardened. No, he said, I will fight this thing. I will win over it. We will have our chance. His fist pounded the sleeping mat. No one shall take a good fortune from us, he said. His eyes softened then, and he raised a gentle hand to Juana's shoulder. Believe me, he said, I am a man. And his face grew crafty. In the morning... We will take our canoe and we will go over the sea and over the mountains to the capital, you and I. We will not be cheated. I am a man. And that wouldn't be a no pick, no, no playing in the park that going from La Paz over to the mainland. That's a big stretch of water and a little craft. Kino, she said huskily, I'm afraid a man can be killed. Let us throw the pearl back into the sea. Hush, he said fiercely. I am a man, hush. And she was silent, for his voice was command. Let us sleep a little, he said. In the first light, we will start. You are not afraid to go with me. No, my husband. His eyes were soft and warm on her then. His hand touched her cheek. Let us sleep a little, he said. I'm marking this spot so Barb can read it later. For his voice was command, yeah. Yes. Chapter 5. The late moon arose before the first rooster crowed. Kino opened his eyes in the darkness, for he sensed movement near him, but he did not move. Only his eyes searched the darkness, and in the pale light of the moon that crept through the holes in the brush house, Kino saw Juan ar arise silently from beside him. He saw her move toward the fireplace. So carefully did she work that... He heard only the lightest sound when she moved the fireplace stone. And then like a shadow, she glided toward the door. She paused for a moment beside the hanging box where Coyotito lay. Then for a second, she was back in the doorway and then she was gone. And rage surged in Kino. He rolled up to his feet and followed her as silently as she had gone. And he could hear her quick footsteps going toward the shore. 
Quietly, he tracked her, and his brain was red with anger. She burst clear of the brush line and stumbled over the little boulders toward the water, and then she heard him coming, and she broke into a run. Her arm was up to throw when he leaped at her and caught her arm and wrenched the pearl from her. He struck her in the face with clenched fist, and she fell among the boulders, and he kicked her in the side. In the pale light, he could see the little waves break over her, and her skirt floated about and clung to her legs as the water receded. Kino looked down at her, and his teeth were bared. He hissed at her like a snake, and Juana stared at him with wide, unfrightened eyes, like a sheep before the butcher. She knew there was murder in him, and it was all right. She'd accepted it, and she would not resist or even protest. And then the rage left him, and a sick disgust took its place. He turned away from her and walked up the beach and through the brush line. His senses were dulled by his emotion. So... I didn't see that one coming, guys. Um, but... Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Well, they've been... Steinbeck has been talking about him being angry this the whole time, ever since he... Ever, he's been angry ever since he found the pearl. He heard the rush, got his knife out, and lunged at one dark figure and felt his knife go home. And then he swe was swept to his knees and swept again to the ground. Greedy fingers went through his clothes, frantic fingers searched him, and the pearl knocked from his hand, lay winking behind a little stone in the pathway. It glinted in the soft moonlight. Juana dragged herself up from the rocks on the edge of the water. Her face was, dull, was a dull pain and her side ached. She steadied herself on her knees for a while, and her wet skirt clung to her. There was no anger in her for Kino. He had said, I am a man, and that meant certain things to Juana. It meant that he was half insane and half God. Ooh. It meant that Kino would drive his strength against a mountain and plunge his strength against the sea. Juana and her woman's soul knew that the mountain would stand while the man broke himself, that the sea would surge while the man drowned in it. And yet it was this thing that made him a man, half insane and half God. And Juana had need of a man. She could not live without a man, although she might be puzzled by these differences between men and women. She knew them and accepted them and needed them. Of course, she would follow him. There was no question of that. Sometimes the quality of woman, the reason, the caution, the sense of preservation could cut through Kino's mad madness and save them all. It's a beautiful sentence and it reminds me of my grandmas and my moms and Barb, mom's stepmom. Um, and I bet, it, it, I bet it would remind you of a lot of your matriarchy in your family. Um, sometimes the quality of woman, the reason, the caution, the sense of preservation could cut through Kino's madness and save them all. She climbed painfully to her feet. She dipped her cup palms in the little waves and washed her bruised face with the stinging salt water. And then she went creeping up the beach after Kino. A flight of herring clouds had moved over the sky from the south. The pale moon dipped in and out of the strands of clouds so that Juana walked in darkness for a moment and in light the next. Her back was bent with pain and her head was low. She went through the line of brush when the moon was covered and when it looked through, she saw the glimmer of the great pearl in the path behind the rock. She sank to her knees and picked it up and the moon went into the darkness of the clouds again. Juana remained on her knees while she considered whether to go back to the sea and finish her job. And as she considered, the light came again, and she saw two dark figures lying in the path ahead of her. She leaped forward and saw that one was Kino, and the other a stranger, with dark, shiny fluid leaking from his throat. Kino moved sluggishly, arms and legs stirred like those of a crushed bug, and a thick muttering came from his mouth. Now, in an instant, Juana knew that the old life was gone forever. Mmm, mm-mm. A dead man in the path and Kino's knife, dark bladed beside him, convinced her. All of the time Juana had been trying to rescue something of the old peace, 
of the time before the pearl, but now it was gone and there was no retrieving it. And knowing this, she abandoned the past instantly. There was nothing to do but to save themselves. Her pain was gone now, her slowness. Quickly, she dragged the dead man from the pathway into the shelter of the brush. She went to Kino and sponged his face with her wet skirt. His senses were coming back and he moaned. They have taken the pearl. I have lost it. Now it is over, he said. The pearl is gone. Juana quieted him as she would a quiet, a sick child. Hush, she said. Here is your pearl. I found it in the path. Can you hear me now? Here is your pearl. Can you understand? You have killed a man. We must go away. They will come for us. Can you understand? We must be gone before the daylight comes. I was attacked, said Kino uneasily. I struck to save my life. Do you remember yesterday? Juana asked. Do you think that will matter? Do you remember the men of the city? Do you think your explanation will help? Kino drew a great breath and fought off his weakness. No, he said, you are right. And his will hardened and he was a man again. Go to our house and bring Coyotito, he said, and bring all the corn we have. I will drag the canoe into the water and we will go. He took his knife and left her. He stumbled toward the beach and he came to his canoe. And when the light broke through again, he saw that a great hole had been knocked in the bottom and a searing rage came to him and gave him strength. Now the darkness was closing in on his family. Now the evil music filled the night, hung over the mangroves, skirled in the wave beat, the canoe of his grandfather plastered over and over and a splintered hole broken in it. This was an evil beyond thinking. The killing of a man was not so evil as the killing of a boat. For a boat does not have sons, and a boat cannot protect itself, and a wounded boat does not heal. There was sorrow in Kino's rage, but this last thing had tightened him beyond breaking. He was an animal now, for hiding, for attacking, and he lived only to preserve himself and his family. He was not conscious of the pain in his head. He leaped up the beach, through the brush line, toward his brush house, and it did not occur to him to take one of the canoes of his neighbors. Never once did the thought enter his head any more than he could have conceived breaking a boat. Hmm. So that speaks a lot to the culture that he's living in, that he didn't even consider taking a neighbor's boat. One thing's troubling, though. Do you think the town of stone and plaster people know which canoe is Kino's? Do you think the people in the fishing village know which canoe is Kino's? So... Not only are the townspeople, the rich people corrupt, but maybe there's some corruption going on in the village too. The roosters were crowing and the dawn was not far off. Smoke of the first fire seeped out through the walls of the brush houses and the first smell of cooking corn cakes was in the air. Already the dawn birds were scampering in the bushes. The weak moon was losing its light and the clouds thickened and curled to the southward. The wind blew freshly under the estuary, a nervous, restless wind with the smell of storm on its breath. And there was change and uneasiness in the air. Another sentence is just beautiful. Kino, hurrying toward the house, felt a surge of exhilaration. Now he was not confused, for there was only one thing to do. And Kino's hand went first to the great pearl in his shirt, and then to his knife hanging under his shirt. He saw a little glow ahead of him, and then without interval, a tall flame leaped up in the dark with a crackling roar, and a tall edifice of fire lighted the pathway. Kino broke into a run. It was his brush house, he knew, and he knew that th these houses could burn down in very few moments. And as he ran, a scuttling figure ran toward him, Juana, with Coyotitu in her arms, and Kino's shoulder blanket clutched in her hand. See that blanket? has so much cultural significance that you don't leave it behind. The baby moaned with fright, and Juana's eyes were wide and terrified. Kino could see the house was gone, and he did not question Juana. He knew, but she said, It was torn up, and the floor dug. Even the baby's box turned out. And as I looked, they put the fire to the outside. The fierce light of the burning house lighted Kino's face strongly. Who? he demanded. I don't know, she said. The dark ones. The neighbors were tumbling from their houses now, and they watched the falling sparks and stamped them out to save their own houses. Suddenly, Kino was afraid. 
He remembered the man lying dead in the brush beside the path, and he took Juana by the arm and drew her into the shadow of a house away from the light, for light was danger to him. For a moment he considered, and then he worked among the shadows until he came to the house of Juan Tomas, his brother, and he slipped into the doorway and drew Juana after him. Outside he could hear the squeal of children and the shouts of the neighbors, for his friends thought he might be inside the burning house. The house of Juan Tomas was almost exactly like Kino's house. Nearly all the brush houses were alike, and all leaked light and air, so that Juana and Kino, sitting in the corner of the brother's house, could see the leaping flames through the wall. They saw the flames tall and furious. They saw the roof fall and watched the fire die down as quickly as a twig fire dies. They heard the cries of warning of their friends and the shrill, keen cry of Apollonia, wife of Juan Tomas. She, being the nearest woman relative, raised a formal lament for the dead of the family. Raised a formal lament for the dead. So thinking that the family is in the burning house, the Apollonia raised a formal lament. Apollonia cried out um, in sorrow for the family loss. Raised a formal lament, cried out in sorrow. Apollonia realized that she was wearing her second best head shawl and she rushed, rushed to her house to get her fine new one. As she rummaged in a box by the wall, Kino's voice said quietly, Apollonia, do not cry out. We are not hurt. How do you come here? She demanded. Do not question, he said. Go now to Juan Tomas and bring him here and tell no one else. This is important to us, Apollonia. She paused, her hands helpless in front of her. And then, yes, my brother-in-law, she said. In a few moments, Juan Tomas came back with her. He lighted a candle and came to where they crouched in a corner. And he said, Apollonia, see to the door and do not let anyone enter. He was older, Juan Tomas, and he assumed the authority now. He, now, my brother, he said. I was attacked in the dark, said Kino, and in the fight, I've killed a man. Who? asked Juan Tomas quickly. I do not know. It is all darkness, all darkness and shade of darkness. It is the pearl, said Juan Tomas. There is devil in the, this pearl. You should have sold it and passed on the devil. Perhaps you can still sell it and buy peace for yourself. And Kino said, Oh, my brother, an insult has been put on me that is deeper than my life. For on the beach, my canoe is broken. My house is burned. And in the brush, a dead man lies. Every escape is cut off. You must hide us, my brother. And Kino, looking closely, saw deep worry come into his brother's eyes. And he forestalled him in a possible refusal. Not for long, he said quite quickly. Only until a day has passed and the new night has come, then we will go. I will hide you, said Juan Tomas. I do not want to bring danger to you, Kino said. I know I am like a leprosy. I will go tonight and then you will be safe. 